Uh, we're going to turn it over to our third speaker of the morning, uh, David Larrabee. Uh, David works for Nerdcore. Is that the name? Nerd Noir. Nerd Noir. Oh, sorry. <laughs> He's fancy. <laughs> oh, <laughs> just sweet and snob. <laughs> Uh, and he's going to talk about fostering the third wave, or your DevOps dojo. So thank you, David. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Hi. Hey. Hello, CBUS. Does anyone call it CBUS? Is that, is it like, no? Okay, hello. Hello, Columbus. Hello, Columbus. My name is Dave Larrabee. Uh, I'm a New Yorker living in Atlanta. Um, I'm an independent consultant. My company's Nerd Noir. It's the impossible object you're seeing there, logo. Uh, I've got 20 or so years <clears throat> in um, product engineering. So kind of like half product management, half software engineering. Right? Started with embedded systems and kind of found my way into product. Uh, former version one product development coach. So what I do now is I kind of work with organizations large and small to instill a notion of product thinking. A lot of times, those are in digital transformation contexts. Um, so the story you're going to hear today is really about the Target Dojo and some of the work I did there with my buddy Joel Tosi uh, through a company called DevJam uh, at the Target Dojo. So what do you think of when I say Dojo? Rick Squando, style over substance, right? You think, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's not what we're talking about. We're really not, we're not really talking about this either, right? It is a borrowed term, right, from the world of martial arts. Uh, some of you may be familiar with dojo as like the classic coder dojo, where a bunch of developers get together and work on a kata, game of life. Code retreat is a good example of that. And that's a valid form of dojo, but that's really not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the Target Dojo, which has kind of gotten a lot of attention in the last couple years. And my relationship to that was, as a consultant, to come in and be a temporary head coach, to work my way out of a job and help them kind of tune up and scale up and get this thing going. And so my buddy Joel and I joined the Target Dojo back in 2016. And you know, what I hope to present here are some of the insights or some of the kind of key findings that we found trying to bring a product concept to the DevOps world. All right. So, a definition. A dojo is a six-week deep dive with bi-weekly iterations where a team sets balanced technical business and product goals, identifies success measures against those goals, think OKRs, right? And uh, iterates rapidly. So, every two weeks is a new iteration or sprint if you're of the scrum flavor, right? And they share their learning. So, twice a week you have this kind of validated learning or validation events where we do a real meaningful kind of demo, and I'll share what that process looks like, all while supported by dedicated coaches. Now, I don't mean necessarily like agile coaches, right, that gather everyone into a circle and we do whale songs. You know, I don't talk about like agile coaches coming with their big kit of Legos to build, you know, simulation experiences that give us the feel of technical debt. I mean, actual product, product and tech coaches, right? So. Coaches that are really kind of focused on the PM side and coaches that are really focused on like hardcore tech. Not there's nothing wrong with Agile. It's needed, but you know, it's just a different context. So when we got there, Target had done a lot of work. I mean, you know, Ross Clanton, who's one of the founders of the dojos, really kind of was the, the champion of this and got it to be an actual funded program, got it to be, you know, got the space, which is like half a floor in, the, in their camp, one of the buildings in their campus, a huge space, we'll look at that in a second. But they did this kind of work to understand what is the point of DevOps. Why would we want to do this? Right? So what you're seeing here is a value stream map, and it takes about 52 days to get a Tomcat container provisioned. So what does everyone do? Once they get a whiff of product, once they get a whiff of like, oh, this is going to be a project, we need to do it, boom, hit the button. Let's uh, go to service now. Let's get that sucker provisioned, right, before it's funded. So now what do you have? You have a garbage collection problem. You have a ton of, like, Tomcat containers that never actually had any kind of code put in them, right? So you have to kind of game the system to work in these cross-siloed ways. This is nothing new. Like, this is kind of the fundamental premise of DevOps. This is, like, the first way, right, as Gene Kim says, you're moving from left to right in a flow kind of state. So I just want to be very clear. They had put in the work before they even heard of me or Joel or anything like that. I don't want to kind of uh, steal any of their, their thunder. 
Now, the space was really kind of an interesting space. Has anyone been to the Target Dojo? John Willis, I'm not surprised. Hey, buddy, how are you? Um, so, this space is big. You know, it's massive. It's plastered in all kinds of agile wallpaper, right? Teams have more or less fit in these kind of tables. Uh, so you have 16 tables, roughly you could accommodate 16, more or less two pizza teams working on a six week challenge, okay? They, you know, something like 150 whiteboards. We got them up to 12 concurrent teams uh, by the time I left. So here you have the team tables. Then you also have coaching bullpen. This is where your kind of coach, your resources, your, you know, your me's of the world are sitting when you're not pinned to a team, right? So that's kind of a nice area for space. You can kind of get away from, from the, uh, the fray. Then we have a nice demo lounge. So demo, this kind of notion of we're doing these demos is permeating the atmosphere. And I'll share you, with you where we landed on demos, uh, at least in my time there. Sorry, that's the demo lounge. And then... Key to this is leadership is sitting right in the midst. They're right there. And it's not like a monitoring thing. It's just like, this is my program. I'm the executive producer. I'm writing the checks. I care about the product. Right? So they're kind of constantly doing Gemba walks, walking through the teams, answering questions, getting feedback on the dojo as a kind of product itself. So <laughs> a couple things we noticed like immediately day one landing is that there was an awful lot of tool, tool fetishism going on, right? There was like, we want to get this tool chain up and running. We want to get this. And, but when we started probing the teams, what we found is these teams maybe hadn't ever worked together. And after the dojo, they weren't going to work together. And I think there's an easier way to do DevOps if, if that's uh, your plan, right? You can just kind of pipe it to dev null. No one's using these products. There's no product. It's just a tool chain. And that's a valid goal. I'm not trying to beg on that. It's a valid goal to learn the tool chain. You know, learn the target standard continuous delivery tool chain. But there's no real opportunity to evolve that tool chain, right? There's no opportunity to use the feedback that comes out of this system to evolve your product, right? These are project-oriented things. So really what I'm kind of getting at is the project over uh, product. And, you know, there's a real reason. Target was kind of going through a reorganization at the time. So a lot of people are using the dojo to shelter in place. I don't know what my job role will be in two or three weeks, so I'll just go in the dojo and let the bosses decide, right? And, you know, I was there long enough to kind of let see that clear up and uh, help kind of introduce some of the product thinking vibes that we want to see. So I want to focus on three points. First thing we sought to introduce there is kind of focusing on balance with a shared frame of reference. So a couple things I'm passionate about, eliminating handoffs ruthlessly. Handoffs are the enemy. If you see a handoff, what you have there is a context switch. You have a really tough time necessarily picking up work that comes through like a mail slot, more or less, right? And a classic example from a developer, you'll hear the requirements aren't good enough. Yeah, they probably aren't. They weren't privy necessarily to where those requirements were developed. Second thing is getting people to do the work and engage with organizing their own work. So they have skin in the game. It's not that you're tasked with work. It's not that you're some kind of human compiler turning business whim into product success, right? It's that you're kind of involved in a highly collaborative uh, environment. So rule number one, I think, is when you're looking at these kind of dojo things, uh, focus and balance with a shared frame of reference. Establish that frame of reference as a team. I kind of believe in this notion of having a coaching mantra. So this is my mantra. Uh, like all good things, I stole it from someone else, right? I think uh, I try to kind of keep this in mind. People support a world they help to create. And that's where a lot of this stuff that we developed can't, comes from. So here you have a team. This is not Target. This is a uh, team at Travelers, which is a large insurance company. We've been rolling out this kind of dojo approach now for the last couple of years. But this team is getting together and setting their own course. They may have been given some high-level goals or outcomes that you know, leadership is trying to pursue, but it's up to them to formulate how they pursue those outcomes. So we're gathering the right people. We're trying to get the right people in the room in this kind of Think of this as kind of a designer meeting, a meeting that doesn't suck, 
right? This is a really on-the-rails facilitated session. My job in these meetings is to, that's not me, that's my buddy Steve, but my job is to kind of keep people on the rails and push toward outcome, push toward some of the uh, uh, direction we're trying to get to. Now this meeting produces an artifact. This is a really lo-fi artifact using two of the original agile tools, post-its and Sharpies, right? Some stickers maybe if you're lucky. But here, I'm gonna take you through this. And one thing, it's a little departure from my usual talks. I try to put a lot of information in this slide deck. I'll have a link at the end. So if you wanna try this, I try to make it so at least you could have a hope of trying it. So it's kind of a takeaway, right? So let's go through this one by one. So teams in the dojo begin with a frame to set their context and goals. The frame expresses the team's purpose, skill set, and community makeup. It contains goals, assumptions, and identifies the core metrics on those goals that tell our team if their actions are leading to the desired outcome, or if that outcome's even possible or doable. Also, you know, as a consultant, you kind of need your own canvas, right, just to make it in the business. That's a joke. Um, so we begin with your team name. And so the team name, and we want that to be a fairly descriptive thing. We'll get to that in a second. But we're looking at a time frame. That time frame isn't a deadline. It's just a healthy constraint that says, within this time, we want to see our measurements pointing toward this outcome. We want to see if our business whim is really, you know, if that hypothesis is valid, okay? Names, when it comes to naming, I don't, I can't tell what any of these teams do. I mean, I really like the, I really like the less but better. I mean, that's a pretty cool thing, but um, I'm not sure what these folks do, right? This is another large company. And, and you know, if I have to walk into another place and, and work with another team that's named after something in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I think I'm just gonna rage quit the, the whole business. So we're looking for literal names. We're looking for names that identify what that purpose, what the purpose of the team is, what they're trying to do. You can add a little bit of cleverness, it's fine, but when you're looking at 12 banners in a giant uh, dojo kind of facility, you need to be able to identify what they're up to, right? So name and time frame. And you'd be really surprised how people get stuck in name and time frame. So this framing process, we often say it's more about the framing than the artifact, the frame, because as a coach, you can really see what's going on with that team. Where are they stumbling? Where are they drifting apart? You know, where are they kind of thinking, uh, my identity is X, or no, my identity is Y, right? So it kind of helps you kind of get them converged. So next thing we're looking at is some kind of elevator pitch or message. And this should basically kind of touch on what the team's doing, who they're doing it for, what the intended value is. This is a very short, we think of it as like almost a tweet length description of the identity and purpose of the team. And it's up to the team to form that. Right? Usually there'll be someone in the room that's kind of the first among equals. Usually it's going to be like a product manager is calling the shots. You know, but the team kind of provides that product manager with input as to what the elevator pitch is. Again, we're looking for convergence. We're looking to get to shared mental models. We're looking to get that team on the same page and operating as one cohesive unit. So here's an example of an elevator pitch. I won't read it aloud. It's got some issues. It's not perfect. I'm okay with that, right? This is a really important thing about framing. Framing is an iterative process. We do it until we get it right. Now, writing in a writing room is probably not something we're really used to. Um, I actually did this for a uh, magazine publisher, and they're, they were really good with it because they're used to writing in a writing room, right? But as developers and engineers, we generally kind of writing as a solitary activity. So there's kind of just a few different techniques you can use to break this up. One is pair people up, have them write a pitch, and do a little pitch contest. All right. So next, we're gonna go into this kind of goal setting method, right? This is similar to like objectives and key results, popularized by Intel and Google. But it's a little different because it's anchored on the team and the product, right? What are the objectives and key results at a team level? And we're using this in, instead of shoveling a whole pile of scope onto a team, right? We're using this to kind of get a team thinking aspirationally and in a short time frame, how they might kind of make some payments toward that goal or is that goal even possible? So example of this, 
And again, it's not pretty. It usually isn't when you start. This is, again, something at the end of the time frame, at very least, you would come back around to these goals and say, do we have data, qualitative or quantitative, that proves whether or not they're valid? Now, goals are backed by success measures. So goals are being more aspirational. Success measures are more attainable within that time frame. And we're looking to really find success measures that have some kind of quanti element to them. You know, page load times decreased by 20%, right? The other kind of main feature to look at is on the left-hand side, you'll see business product technical. So when I'm setting OKRs or, or guiding a team through setting their own kind of goals and success measures, what I'm trying to do is get them thinking in different dimensions. You know, we all know, where does technical debt come from, right? It comes from the delivery versus quality kind of, you know, divide that's inherent in software development, right? And who wins? Delivery. Right? Delivery wins every time. So here what we're trying to say is do we have technical goals maybe that we want to pursue? Do we want to pay back some tech debt? Do we want to try a new kind of practice as a team? Um, do we want to beef up our CI CD pipeline? Do we want to do a canary deployment, etc.? Those are the kind of things that become like almost like hidden emotional labor for a team if you're not putting them up there. Now, you know, I kind of work in big enterprise, and it's very common to see like scaled agile framework teams that just pack their iterations full of business value. Six iterations, 100% packed with capacity, business value. So when does anything, like, when does any infra stuff happen? Right. Okay. So again, we're looking for balance here. We're looking to try to balance product, technical, business. Business. Think P&L, think income statement, think revenue generation, think cost savings. Product, think getting these users, having higher engagement, uh, you know, product stuff, right? Technical, think changing the game, making things more efficient, you know, killing some crufty code if we can. Okay. So next thing we go to is a community map. So community map helps the team and coaches understand if there's a right level involvement at a team level. We're looking for active participation members from team members that, you know, care about the, the value of what we're doing. We're looking for people that are really concerned about, are we ultimately satisfying our users, right? Deep user empathy, and are we making a delightful product experience? And we're also looking at folks that care about the, the condition of the system and the artifacts and the, and the feasibility of our engineering efforts. So if we kind of go back to product management 101 or kind of lean startup 101, we have this notion of MVP, which is kind of one of the most overused terms in our industry now, right? But I, you know, ideally we're kind of pursuing the pyramid on the right rather than the pyramid on the left. We're trying to kind of get our product out there with at least one exciter, one kind of feature that's the hook. Think about a hit song, you gotta have a hook, right? We can skip the bridge for now. Let's just go with the hook. And what this looks like is, you know, in my lo-fi way, I'm not the best um, artist in the world, <clears throat> to say the least, but I kind of draw out these three circles. And what I'll say is business, care about, you know, income statement stuff, making money, saving money, sometimes saving lives, you know, if you're kind of Red Cross. Um, we will then look at another circle product where you care about user engagement. You care about, are you satisfying them? Maybe your net promoter score would be a metric in there. And the third is the technical. So we're really trying to hit viable, usable, if not delightful, and feasible, right? And I ask people to write their names on a card and stick it up there. Where do you think you fit? And I don't expect people to fit cleanly in one area or other. That's why it's a Venn diagram. And it's tricky. It's tricky what I'm doing here. What I'm doing is I'm looking for anti-patterns. First anti-pattern I might call wide open spaces. Who even cares about what you're developing here? Who's supporting you? Who's rallying uh, your effort, championing your effort on the business side, right? Another pattern I'll look for is too many cooks, right? We've got everyone that cares about everything simultaneously all the time. Sounds like decision by committee, right? So we're kind of hedged that. And then I'll ask, hey, do you want to kind of maybe for this product, do you want to go off and change your custody? Like, do you want to say, I really care more about this particular thing than that. So give them a chance to kind of refactor. Sometimes it's not a problem. It's really just meant to kind of open that dialogue and open that discussion. So 
La the second to last thing on the frame we'll do is a skills matrix. So during this step, we're finding opportunities for skills transfer, tr transfer, mentoring, filling gaps between team ambition and capabilities, right? And this knowledge is super key for like dojo coaches because we kind of know where we can invite collaboration. Who can I pair with, right? If I'm a tech coach and I know everything about Docker, right? And we've identified Docker as a really important uh, skill to have in our team then I could see this person is a ringer, this person wants to know it, why don't we pair? Or I'm a ringer, let's pair, right? It's a player coach. Now, a couple things we're looking for here, and the way I run this, just facilitate this, is I just say, what are all the skills you want? Okay, and everyone's like, they just tell me their tool chain. I'm like, okay, what, other, what are some of the soft skills or people skills that you want? Because we kind of want to take account for that. We think it takes both. And then we'll write everyone's name down here. And I like this approach of X is got it, O is want it, and nothing is just conspicuously absent, right? So if you don't put anything on there, maybe you know what's up, but you're just sick of writing reports, right? You're just like, I retired from that for this product. So a couple things we're looking for. Here we can see the kind of plinko of um, the skills matrix where we don't, if BI is really important, if business intelligence is really important to this product, we might need to get someone on this team, <laughs> or we might need to uh, engage with a coach that has that skill, right? And that's where the dojo is looking to kind of support that. The other thing we're looking for is, you know, mentioned this before, but collaboration opportunities, right? So look at, you know, Datadog here. This, this is a good thing. Maybe we want to open with some kind of mob programming experience in our six-week time together. Right, kind of really, people, a lot of people are interested in acquiring that skill. We have a couple people that, you know, say they're strong with that skill. Let's get it into a mob. So lastly, we agree on logistics as a team. And I really like this because it takes process out of, like, the Bureau of Central Process Commands control and puts it in the team's control. The team can decide how they want to organize within a few constraints. Now, we've set the biweekly iterations. That was really important. That was set before we got there, just to be clear. And that was really good, because it gets people hooked on and used to and like really stoked on feedback, right? But within that, what are your core hours? How do you want to communicate? What's your Slack channel? Let the team self-organize. That's what Agile's supposed to do. We're not supposed to be kind of victims of a large-scale process tax. I mean, there's probably no wondering how I feel about safe, but uh, you know. So in the dojo, we end, like, one thing we end with is a commitment ceremony, and we found this really important. You know, in our first few teams that we got there, we'd, we'd say, okay, let's frame it out. Okay, you're ready. We've got a place for you. See you Monday. Crickets. No one shows up. Not for every team, but, you know, we kind of thought that commitment would be a really important thing to place in. So framing, you know, the point of this is just kind of make it your own. You can add modules. i kind of sharing the core modules to framing. Um, but here we have a really interesting, if Rodney shows up, then Dave agrees to coach his team, all right? So this is a predicate. This is like an option, all right? So the strike price is Rodney showing up, and the answer is yes. So again, the artifact, three simple pages. And this becomes essentially the, the kind of agile wallpaper in your room, the first little information radiator, radiator that you have. The reason you want it up where you work, if you can, if you can be co-located, or at least put in front of you or available like as like an attachment in a Slack room or something, a Slack chat uh, topic, something like that, is that you want to not just have this go be dead documentation. You want this to guide the team. And as a, from a coaching perspective, this becomes a sounding board. If we kind of veer from this, it's not like stick to the plan. It's more like let's change the plan, right? This plan, we've learned something. This plan is no longer good. So taking you through the process, it's a little bit longer than 30 minutes allows to explain, but we'll go through, we'll kind of run this session. It's pretty, um, you know, this is something that I can take any coach and they can pair with me and within four or five sessions, they're just fine at it. They're great, right? It's really lo-fi tool, easy to adopt. We'll go through, we'll create our frame, lots of skills required, right, on this one. What you're not seeing is we'll go and do a, um, some mapping, and that mapping will be appropriate for the turf. So if it's like some kind of digital mobile web product type thing, 
we will do things like empathy maps, story maps, customer journey maps. If it's something more systemic, we will do something like events, uh, event storming or impact mapping, right? But we do some kind of kinesthetic mapping as a group, and we, from there, we pull a backlog. We'll pull that backlog into usually some kind of simple lo-fi Kanban pull system, and from there, the team kind of makes it their own. We're trying to encourage involvement, right? Number two. I gotta start talking really fast. I'm way behind. Okay, iterate toward the right thing while doing it the right way. So my friend and mentor, late great David Hussman, uh, had this, this was his email signature, right? So if you, if you don't know where you're going, it's easy iteratively not to get there. We hope framing will help you with that. But really to me, this is about avoiding product arrogance or getting fixed. If you frame for six months and you stick to the frame and you're not courting these kind of feedback loops, you're likely to end up here. This is Juice Harrow. Juicero is a product, it's like the most recent epic fail, right, in product arrogance. But it's the perfect case study, right? Juicero said, oh, wow, you can bring cold-pressed juice into the comfort of your own home at a save $3 per juice. So instead of eight bucks, it's five bucks, right? But really, <laughs> what Juicero was is a glorified 10-ton press, and it turns out the products don't really require a 10-ton press, you can just squeeze them out with your hand. So now you've got a $500 10-ton press made of Formula One, you know, grade uh, parts, um, you, know, oh, you know, from the school of if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing engineering, right? But it's not just that. I mean, I think also, too, about fatigue, like just tool fatigue. DevOps, certainly, case. I, when I think of tool fatigue, I think of JavaScript, JavaScript fatigue, you know. But certainly in DevOps, we have the same thing, right? We have tool fatigue <laughs> in DevOps. <laughs> We have so many options. Look at the, the sponsors out there. I mean, it looks awesome, but what do I pick, right? And, you know, you're kind of going through that whole uh, thing. So I think, like, kind of reaching back, and this comes from my background is extreme programming, right? And this comes from Kent Beck. The idea that values drive your choice of practices, like soft tools, or tools, hard tools, like your software tools, right? And that kind of, that's something they, I don't, think really necessarily had top of mind at the Target Dojo when we got there. So we're kind of driving that and saying, look, if our goal is to really court these continuous feedback loops and get that going, what kind of tools should we focus on in the beginning? How should we spend our six-week time together? So reducing that. I think if Gene Kim were a demagogue, it would be like, feedback loops, shorten and amplify feedback loops, continually. So, you know, framing helps us there. But it's, large, it's part of a larger process. And this is the process we landed on. I'm not saying go, you're know, not trying to sell you anything, any process here. Uh, I'm just trying to say this is what we landed on. So we would take our frame. That was kind of our product hypothesis and, and our community charter, right? We'd run into some map plan and size. We don't estimate, we size. You can't estimate when you do two iterations per week. So it's a really good way to kind of uh, get people into the no estimates vibe. Right? Then we move on and we start doing deliver, delivery alongside of discovery. So we do just enough discovery to get started, but then we keep going with it alongside of delivery. We present discovery learnings alongside delivery and demo. Right? It's not just all eyes on the developers. It's what is everyone doing in this team? What do we want to kind of get feedback on? We'll take that into a kind of quantitative learning uh, demo where we'll share what we have, our artifacts. It could be sketches, they could be working software, it could be any number of things. And we'll get larger group comments. Someone will be writing these comments down, and that's what we call like qualitative uh, feedback. Meanwhile, we're building our continuous deployment pipe. You know, we're building our pipeline. We're building it in first C automated test, first CI, then CD, then the other CD, right? We're kind of building it as we go. And Really what we're trying to get out of continuous delivery here is continuous learning, more quantitative continuous learning, telemetry. Now we'll cover what goes on in there in a minute, but like how you process that feedback becomes really important, or how you start to process that feedback. And then we look at that feedback and say, do we need to pivot our frame? Does our hypothesis change? Are there any little micro pivots that we can make? If so, let's do it now as a team, okay? Should we disband because this was a dumb idea? That's cool, yes, we're psychologically safe, well, let's do that. 
So this is the kind of another tool I'd like to share with you. Instead of doing a standard retrospective, when you have two iterations per week, you don't need to do a team feels retrospective twice a week. You should do one, you know, halfway through the challenge, sure. But you really want to kind of process the feedback you got from demo. And this is what makes, to me, these agile ceremonies really valuable. So I like this insight retrospective where someone will scribe all of the comments that come back from that feedback session, right? And the team will kind of parse those things and try to understand what the comments, you know, what the, what the people coming to the demo were asking for, right? So we're actually getting valuable data that we could start to pull into our planning process. This is a team at Travelers again that did this, and you can see they're tracking comments over every demo. And so really interesting, they're able to kind of get uh, that qualitative feedback uh, very, very quickly. So I basically run out of time. But I'm going to run through this real quick. Number three, scale product. Culture, not process. The goal is not to scale process so everyone kind of meets this process, but to get product impacts at scale. So we want to avoid this, right? So if you think about the dojo approach, you know, <laughs> The target dojo is really flat, all the leaders on one side. To me, that's a kind of like winning ingredient to get to that. We want to go slow before we scale. We want to figure out what our product is. So if you kind of roll out your digital transformations in and of themselves are products, and thinking of that way can really help. So tip number one, place and proximity matter. When you put people in this kind of environment, you're protecting them from death by a thousand meetings. Tip number two, take a product-driven approach to setting cultural tone and scaling up, right? So think about your dojo as a product, right? Think about your digital transformation effort as a product. So if you're pre-problem solution fit, scaling is not your problem at that point. I'm going to skip this. We did this framing approach with the dojo team itself, right? It really helps kind of get that dojo team on board and like say, what is our identity? What is our product? Right. So yeah, I'm gonna skip this, sorry. It's all in there, There's all, this is a fully scripted talk even though it's way too long. Um, uh, da, da, da. So in summary, frame collaboratively for alignment, impact, and balance. Oh, I, oh okay, that went to, Okay, that's cool. <laughs> Thanks, man. I'm a little afraid of John Willis, so I just don't want to like cut into his time there. Yeah, he's like he's like that super sweet but kind of intimidating dude. I don't want you know. Anyway, um, okay, cool. Let's go back here. So one thing I thought was really cool, and you know, I was an early adopter in Kanban, you know, kind of pull systems, and I think. One thing I see str people struggling with with Kanban is what is their whip, trying to understand what their whip is. And the first kind of anti-pattern you go to is our whip is going to be the number of people we have on our team. Or if we're pairing, number of people we have on our team divided by two, right? And so one thing we really helped uh, the target dojo kind of figure out is what is the whip limit for the whole dojo as a system? So now we're talking moving up a level and looking at the whole dojo itself as a pull system, not just the individual challenges, each having their little Kanban, right? And you can see there's some lateral thinking going on here. We're inventing cube technology with blue tape. Uh, but what you see here is a card, right? This card represents a challenge, a team in flight. The yellow cards are the coaches that are pinned to that team. We can tell what skills that team needs based on the skill matrix. So we have a very clear finding, understanding and make Serious promises about lead time. Cycle time's fixed. Cycle time's six weeks. So we could definitely make that promise. But we could tell you, hey, team that wants to come in and, you know, maybe work uh, with uh, Kubernetes, right? Which really wasn't an issue back in 2016, but you, you want to kind of, you know, create a cluster, get that up and going. We can do that because our Kubernetes person is available after this challenge. So here, you know, we kind of created a high-level overview of where the teams are, you know, in, in situ. One thing you'll notice is like the, the box on the left and the box on the right. Um, we kind of found an issue around burnout with coaches because two iterations per week is pretty intense. I wouldn't say it's necessarily the most sustainable pace, right? But it's a great pace to get bootstrapped on and go back into a week-long iteration. 
So here uh, we kind of refactored our board or our pull system to have a moment where, you know, coaches could kind of back off and they'd be available to you, but they might just be able to, you know, kind of rest and recuperate a little bit. There are people doing this for, you know, I know some of the coaches still there, so they've been doing it for at least two years, right? Two iterations per week for two years. All right, finally, okay. So in summary, I think if you're looking to kind of adopt this model, the advice I have is to frame collaboratively for alignment, impact, and balance, and have the team kind of invest and throw down and supply what that means. Don't supply that to them. Second, look for the right thing and the right way. So just because we have a perfect kind of CICD rig doesn't mean we're necessarily creating software that has some kind of impact or value, right? So right thing, right way. And lastly, scale culture, not process. Process will follow. Life finds a way. All right. I think that's it. Thank you.